Hey folks, uh, my name is Jared and I'm a super passionate ocean nerd, I'm a diver, um, but in more recent years I'm a hobbyist underwater photographer, so I'm by no means a professional, I'm not sponsored by anyone, I just like traveling to cool places um, and taking photographs of uh, critters underwater and, and particularly very, very small things, so macro photography and then really big things like sharks. Um, but the reason that I'm making this video is just to kind of share um, my journey uh, from transitioning from shooting on a GoPro, which was my first camera a decade ago, um, to a very old second-hand uh, underwater video set up on a Sony HDR something or other that still shot on cassette tapes and to manually transfer everything across to your computer, which, which sucks, but I learned some great techniques. But I decided that I wanted to get into still photography and that necessitated um, a whole change in my equipment configuration, the stuff that I was using, learning a bunch of new techniques. Um, and why I'm making this video is in particular regards to this camera here. Uh, it's called the Olympus TG5. Um, and I got this camera thinking I was going to use it for not very long, um, learn some basics. Uh, and then it wasn't going to be powerful enough uh, to do the things that I wanted it to do. Um, and certainly the, the first couple of times I used it, I got very, very frustrated because I was learning a, a whole new set of skills. But the adage is that a, you know, a good cook or, or um, a good builder never blames his tools. And, and this is a really powerful little piece of kit for um, you know, 550 bucks worth of camera down here in Australia. Uh, and the reason that I'm making this video is uh, not to endorse it. There are lots of really fabulous cameras out there and really fabulous configurations, but a lot of people ask about this. And they ask about this piece of equipment, um, and I found myself asking an awful lot of people an awful lot of questions um, about how to take good pictures with this. And I suppose I just briefly want to talk about the camera. So as you can see, it's this tiny little point and shoot it's uh, 12 megapixels and and don't let that put you off unless you're planning on producing really wide format prints um, this has got plenty of oomph uh, to put your photographs on uh, on social media or to get them printed and, and to have them come out in quite high resolution the other thing that i really like about this camera is that it shoots in raw and what RAW is, is a less compressed or not compressed file type. So that means when you go to edit your photographs afterwards and we're underwater, it's this um, kind of foreign environment and there's all sorts of variables that can impact the quality of our images. When we go to edit in, say, Lightroom, for example, which is a really popular tool for that, having a RAW file uh, to work with means that when you do manipulate the image you do much less harm um, to that file so it maintains a high level of quality as you uh, edit, edit the photograph so that's a really really powerful uh, asset for this little camera and um, the other thing that it has that I really like um, is it's got exposure compensation and what that means is that you can uh, dial down how sensitive the camera is to light and that means that you produce uh, deeper blues when you're shooting wide angle um, and the other thing that it does is it helps trick the shutter speed so this is something that this camera doesn't do uh, the new one does the the TG6 uh, allows you to set a minimum shutter speed but I haven't uh, taken photographs with that camera I've never used one so I don't know the precise details but if you want to take a photograph of something that's moving quite quickly you need a high shutter speed uh, and the way to trick this camera into doing that is to turn the exposure compensation down so you say I want you to capture less light so I want the shutter to um, to go faster so that's something that I really like about this. Another thing that it does, if you're into this kind of thing, is it does shoot in 4K video, but it's going to eat bucket loads of your data. Um, it's going to use up your SD card very, very quickly. It's going to use your battery very, very quickly. Um, but if you want to capture high-res 4K video, this little guy will do it. Um, the other thing that's nice about this is uh, it's called the Tough. It's called the Tough for a reason, uh, and that's that it is waterproof out of the box. You don't need a housing, um, but there's a whole bunch of reasons why you're going to want one. Um, and you can drop it, trash it, throw it around. This thing's been on a dozen or more trips with me, um, and it gets used pretty heavily, uh, and it's still in really good condition. So I really like this camera, um, and every time I think about upgrading, I actually just find a way to... Um, add on other pieces of equipment that mean I get a, a bit more out of this camera. So what I want to talk about next is how to turn this from a little point and squirt into um, 
a pretty powerful underwater uh, under, underwater rig. And the first thing that you are going to want, the first thing you're going to need is a housing. Um, so a housing, and again, uh, for those of you who are underwater photographers, this is going to be meat and potatoes to you. I apologize if I'm uh, telling you things that you already know. This isn't meant for you guys. This is meant for people like me who two years ago uh, were learning all of this for the first time. So housings. Lots of people make housings. Icolite make housings. Um, I think, I mean, Olympus, which is uh, what I have, they make a housing for this. Um, Isota, I think they make housings for it. CNC, I think make housings for it. So there are lots of different people that make housings. And the difference tends to be in price uh, and how robust those housings are. So what they're made out of, um, the different ways that they seal the housing. So whether they have a double O-ring, so there's two O-rings, it gives you a bit of redundancy or a single O-ring, um, whether it's a polycarbonate housing, so plastic or whether it's aluminium, all sorts of things. So really you do you. Um, it's kind of up to how much that you want to spend um, and which brand you're willing to put your money and your faith into. I have the Olympus one. This is it here. And that's about 450 bucks. Um, underwater photography, I'm afraid to tell you, even at the, the budget end, is a crazy expensive hobby. Um, that being said, from here on out, everything I'm going to show you, I have purchased secondhand and have got years and years out of. Um, so it's okay to be thrifty if you know what to look for, and there's a whole bunch of commentary online uh, about that. So I'm not going to talk about it. But I'm not ashamed to buy things secondhand, um, especially as you're learning. You know, as you're when you're a professional and you really, really know what you want, go ahead and spend tens of thousands of dollars and buy new. But if you're learning, ah, don't be ashamed to buy stuff that's used. So this is the housing. And what it does is it protects the camera down to about 40 meters of salt water. On it, I have this thing, it's called a tray. And this is important because I need these ball joints to be able to mount things to it. The things that I want to mount to this are things like video lights, strobe lights. I also want somewhere to store accessories like lenses, which I can do on my strobe arms. But it also gives me all of this extra stability underwater. So if I'm lining up a macro shot where my subject is five millimeters away from the lens, I want to be able to hold this really, really, really still and get really, really close to my subject. And this helps me do that. It also helps me keep my hands out of the way so I don't touch the reef and I don't touch the subject. And it also means that I can access my trigger pretty easily. So highly recommend that you invest in a tray. This is an IDAS one. It's uh, aluminum, I think. There's heaps of different variants. Again, I don't feel particularly strong about one brand or another. This is just the one that I got at the time. So you're gonna need a housing. And the other thing that you're gonna want is this thing here. And this is called the thread. And it's often referred to in millimeters, how wide the thread is. This one is 52 millimeters. And what that dictates is what I can and cannot screw onto the front. And they vary from one housing to the next. So that's quite an important thing to bear in mind. If you want to add accessory lenses to your housing, which ones do you need? So this very important kit for you to get started in underwater photography with the Olympus TG5 or the TG6. You're gonna need one of these and you're gonna need one of these. Out of the box, in good clear blue water with natural light, this thing takes fantastic pictures. If you wanna start shooting macro, which is what this thing is best at, you're gonna need some light sources. Now I do actually, before I go on, wanna talk about this um, camera's macro capability because it is mythically good. Olympus makes, um, uh, what do you call them? Not magnifying lenses like laboratory lenses, microscopes, that's the word I'm looking for. And when they developed the TG5, I was speaking to an Olympus rep at a dive show uh, earlier this year in Sydney, and he said when they made the TG5, they basically asked their camera division, what out of all of our technology do you want the most? And they came back and they said, we want the microscope technology and we want to put it in this tiny little point and shoot camera. So. The Olympus TG5 has a mode called microscope mode and it has no minimum focus distance. That means from the lens to wherever it is your subject is can be zero and it will still focus on it. So you could have a subject right up against the lens and take a photograph of it. I've taken photographs of nudibranchs and of uh, frogfish that would have been in the five millimeter range so very 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 small right up against the lens and they have come out razor razor sharp so that is this camera's bragging right it is what it is best at um, and 
once you add a light source to the housing, this camera's ability to take, I would say, award-winning photographs um, with a very basic setup is, is phenomenal. But light sources are an important thing. So when I first started, I had one of these. I had two of them actually, but it's uh, called an iTorch Pro 6. It's a two and a half thousand lumen video light and you screw a rechargeable battery into the back of it. I got this as a part of a GoPro kit probably seven or eight years ago and I use it to this day. It gets mounted to an arm like that and it allows me to give uh, an artificial light source. Now video lights are quite functional for a couple of reasons and especially if you're learning they're a really gentle start into uh, utilizing artificial light sources. There's a couple of reasons. The first is that it's a constant light. So when you switch it on, the camera sees how the subject is going to be light lit before you take the image. So you don't have to spend too much time farting around with your strobe settings. So artificial constant light means lighting and composing your scene uh, is much, much easier. There are a few challenges though. The first is these aren't particularly powerful, so two and a half thousand lumen might sound like a lot, but you really need to be close enough to your subject to touch it for these lights to be effective when you're taking a picture. Um, for video, it's much the same, so the throw distance is not crash hot, and that's because water absorbs light really, really, really quickly. If you want to restore colour to your images, which what the first thing that will happen when you take this in the water is you'll take an image and it's going to be green and gross and you go, fuck, I bought this awful camera, it doesn't work. It's because water removes colour out of the, uh, the light spectrum and we have to replace it artificially using lights. And video lights are a reasonably inexpensive way to do this. The more powerful, the better. They're quite small, they have rechargeable batteries, they're reasonably invincible. I've treated these things very roughly and they've lasted me a very long time. So, for macro photography or when you're photographing things that are really close to you without an accessory lens, these are great, these are fine. And if you can pick them up second hand and they're still, you know, they've been well looked after, nothing wrong with this. So, artificial light source, it's something you're going to need and it's something that you'll need very quickly if you want to start taking photographs below about five meters of salt water. So if you're snorkeling, you can use this and you'll capture nice images, but as soon as you've got a scuba tank on, you want an artificial light source. So I've got one of these in the box and I still use them. If I'm trying to compose a photograph of something really small or really shy that doesn't like bright lights and doesn't like being spooked, so things like uh, peacock mantis shrimp, like notoriously shy creature, it was in its burrow and I just went and hung out there and I had this on its lowest setting, right at the edge of its burrow, and I sat there for about five minutes, and eventually it came back out, because it was, I think it must have gotten used to the light source, and when I came confident enough to go and check out what's going on, then I got my photograph. So these are great for that. Um, however, they are limited by their power output, and the really big ones, so like super powerful underwater video lights, mega bucks. So you are going to want to add a strobe. This here, is called an Enon Z2240 Type 4. Um, it's about five years old, I bought it second hand. Um, you can, again, buy them new, but they're about a thousand bucks each. I got them second hand for half that, and they've got heaps of life left in them. What these do is they have a guide rating of 20, I think, and what a guide rating is, you'll hear about this in forums if you're going out researching stuff you might want to add to your cam camera rig. A guide number is how powerful the strobe is. In layman's terms, that's all you need to know. There's a technical explanation for it, but as far as you care, higher the guide number, more powerful the strobe is. They're also quite heavy. So that's another consideration. These things are about 400 grams a piece. So if you want to travel with them, bear that in mind. But they're really powerful. And so if I want to shoot a wide angle scene and I need two of them, I've got to get this bad boy all the way out here to light my scene or I've got to tuck it all the way in to get a really bright shot of something that's really colorful. This helps me with that. The other thing is it's got a fast recycle time. So recycle time is the speed it takes for it to power up to take another shot. And on this one, it's about a second. So there are little strobes, there are big strobes, there are cheap strobes, there are expensive strobes, but at the end of the day, they all kind of do the same thing. There are varying degrees of quality, and you can read about that on a bunch of forums. I'm not going to get involved, but a strobe is what you need 
if you want to take wide angle photographs and that's really important to remember. The other thing is that these will get a few hundred shots out of them whereas that on full blast 40 minutes to an hour so it's going to go flat on you which means you've got to carry spare batteries around or if you're running it at full tilt like on a night dive for example it's going to go flat and then you have to switch to a backup light source and that'll frustrate your pants off you so bear that in mind it's a limitation but again use it all the time. The next thing I'm going to talk about, and I know I'm waffling on a little bit here, is lens selection. So this is when it starts to get really expensive. If you're shooting on a DSLR uh, or even a micro th uh, four thirds camera, so um, what they call a mirrorless camera, lenses are expensive. And then what they call ports and domes are expensive. So the thing that screws onto the front of the housing to allow you to use those lenses to capture a specific shot. With the TG5, you don't have that problem. Uh, so I wanna share with you, I use three lenses. The first is this one right here. This here is a fantastic macro lens. It's a flat port, I can get super close to my subject, I can zoom through it if I have to, I can use a microscope mode, fantastic. However, it has some limitations. When you go underwater, water has a refraction effect. And so that means the camera's field of view, how far it can see in a cone, is restricted and so I can't capture wide shots like I would above water once I'm underwater with the TG5 so I have one of these I bought them off Backscatter or I bought this off Backscatter they're an American online store uh, if you've researched the TG5 you've probably come across their videos if you haven't they're a super good source of information and I recommend you check them out but this is called an air lens it is a semi wide angle lens which means it has this dome on the front, and all this does is it gives me back the same field of view the camera would have in air above the water. That's why it's called an air lens. What's really nice about this is it's a wet lens, so it means I can take it off and put it on underwater so I can change in and out as I see fit, but I can also zoom through it. So I can put this on my camera at the beginning of a dive and not take it off for the whole dive unless I want to shoot uh, switch to another lens. So. A really really great piece of kit they're not particularly expensive it's about $350 from memory and this allows me to capture semi wide angle shots but it also allows me to capture macro shots I can still get very very close to the subject I can still take great pictures so what this really does is starts to open up the capability uh, of, of your camera of the TG5 and others like it so that's what an air lens does um, it totally totally changed um, the pictures that I was taking or how creative I could get with the pictures I was taking by adding that. The last thing I have, believe it or not, is more expensive than anything else in the kit and it is this bad boy. So this is an ultra wide angle fisheye lens. Uh, there are a bunch of different manufacturers. Um, this one is made by a Chinese company. They make lenses for a whole bunch of people. There are a couple of big differences when you get into lenses and that is the material that the dome is made out of. This one is acrylic, some of them are glass. Glass is always better, but glass is more expensive. The other thing that's different from one wide angle uh, or ultra wide angle to the other is the field of view. So some are 120 degrees, so how wide you can see. This one is 160 degrees. So what that means is that when I'm close to my subject and I'm taking photographs, it will focus on whatever's near to the lens but it will capture everything in 160 degrees either side of that and it will give a fisheye effect to the image. So those super cool shark shots uh, that you see or kind of those iconic fish, they look like they're coming to say hello to the camera lens or coming, hello to say, um, coming to say hello to the dome, that's taken with one of these guys. If you want to shoot reef scapes, so big, big wide angle scenes, you're going to need one of these. Now, don't let it trick you into thinking that you can be a long way away from your subject because what do we know about light? Doesn't go very far underwater. So you're gonna need to be close with one of these and you're gonna need to have a bunch of these, two of them at least. And I use my video lights for backlighting now and again as well. But this is the latest edition. I actually only got this very recently and it just allows me to get super creative with my photographs. Um, but again, all through the TG5. Um, last but not least, you see these things poking off cameras. This is called a strobe arm. You can have one, you can have two, I've got three. The reason I have three is because I want to be able to manipulate it so it's really wide, um, so I can have my strobes a long, long way away from my light, 
uh, sorry, from my, my lens uh, and manipulate shadows. This is where I put my video light. But also if I'm photographing something really small, I can tuck it in tight like this and I can have my light source very close to my subject. So this attaches to your, um, your tray or to your housing. What happens, and this freaked me out a little bit, is these things are bloody heavy. So out of the water, you need to be quite careful to protect your equipment because they'll sag. They'll do a droopy thing. Mmm, not good. Um, so the way you can overcome that is put a bungee strap in between them if you have two of them. Um, or use a, a carry handle, a rope carry handle, um, just to stop that from, from drooping over. Um, the other thing that you might add, and you'll see this on big camera rigs, is one of these things. It's called a, a floaty or a buoyancy or a camera buoyancy um, float, no, a camera float, should I say. And all this does is adds a source of buoyancy to your camera rig. So these things are quite heavy. All of this, even though it's very, very small, it's about three kilos worth of gear. So you've got to lug this thing uh, in and out of the water with you, but also once it's underwater, it might be negatively buoyant, it might be positively buoyant. I like having my camera rig ever so slightly negative. It's very much a personal preference. And what these things do is when I've got my long strobe arms on, is it just makes them a bit easier to manipulate underwater and they'll also stay where they are. Um, the other thing it does is if for any reason I was to drop my camera uh, and it's attached to me, but if I'm diving my rebreather, this thing out the back, you know, my very expensive suicide machine, <clears throat> if something was to go wrong and I had to prioritize uh, my safety and I dropped my camera, these things, it means it's going to sink more slowly and I might be able to see where it goes so I can go and retrieve it later on. But I don't want it to be too buoyant. Very much a personal preference thing, guys. Um, ah, finally, strobes. Bunch of different connectors. It's a very confusing business because there's optical, there's digital, there's all sorts of things. What these are is the mechanism that tells your strobe how and when to fire and how much power to produce. This is a fiber optic connector and this is what works on the TG5. All there is in this little bit here is two fiber optic cables and what they do is they sense the pre-flash that the TG5 produces and they tell the strobes how much power to apply and when to fire. They're quite fragile, so they're made up of lots of little fiber optic uh, fibers. And then that light travels through to this bit here. This is attached to the strobe, and it tells the strobe when to go off. But these are fragile, they are prone to breaking. And if you're going to a remote place, you really want to have spares of those, because if you break them, your strobes aren't going to work. So anyway, guys, that's a very broad overview of shooting with the Olympus TG5 and I hope that if you are just getting into photography or if you're moving from videography to photography if you're considering the TG5 or other cameras like it and there are lots of really good point squirts but this is the one that I love uh, and I've been using it for two years I've just gone through selling off a bunch of stuff thinking I was going to migrate to uh, a mirrorless system and then when I looked at my camera kit, I went, you know what, this all packs into one bag and I can take pictures that I love with it and I'm not going to cry if I break this or I lose it, I can replace it pretty easily. Um, and it's easy to learn. It's not full manual and, and I've kind of, this is the sticking point, guys, if there's anything you take away from this, starting with something like this is you don't have to be an expert photographer, you don't have to be a flipping scientist to understand how to drive it. Um, and you can start taking really good pictures really quickly. And I think as an underwater photographer, the most important thing um, besides your technical ability, so buoyancy is really important, get good at that. But the most important thing is how limited you are by your creativity. And what this camera allows you to do is get creative very quickly um, and to take experimental photographs, to try new things. And then once you reach the limit of its technical capabilities, you can start adding accessories that'll open up um, your photographic options. So things like the ear lens or a wide angle lens or adding one strobe and then two strobes, so on and so forth. So if you want to develop your art, and I am going to call it art because I think underwater photography is kind of a bit of journalism and, and a bit of art, this is a very, very good camera to start with um, and I highly recommend it. So 
if you're thinking about it, if you're just starting to get into underwater photography, I hope that answered some of your questions. I hope it's been objective and I hope that I haven't waffled on too much. If you have got any questions, send me a message. Um, I'm not a pro by any means. I'm just a really passionate diver and really passionate photographer and I wanted to share uh, some of the stuff that I've learned. All the very best. Take care and uh, be safe diving.